Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome to this week's uh, Behind the Lens with Mark Klett. We started this series as a way to conduct studio visits with contemporary photographers to coincide with our weekly photos at Zoom programming. So since last week, we discussed Mark's work as part of our landscape and place lecture. We thought it would be great to take a look at his studio practice today. So the visit will be an hour long. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask, uh, put them in the chat box and I'll take a look periodically to make sure that we can answer those. And uh, just a little bit about Mark. Mark Klett is a Regents Professor at Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona. He has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the Paula Krasner Foundation. He has authored 17 books and his work is held in more than 80 museum collections, including our own at the Museum of Contemporary Photography. So thanks for being with us today, Mark. And I'll uh, go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay, thanks. And uh, you know, thanks for asking me and thanks for being here uh, virtually in uh, Tempe at my studio. Um, I mean, I guess maybe the first thing that, you know, we talked about is maybe I'll just show you the space a little bit because you know where we're at. So um, <clears throat> I'm in the studio. I'll just kind of do a little 360 here. I don't know if you're going to be able to see very much. You kind of have to hold it at this angle uh, just so you can see the space. This is um, a studio that's built for making digital prints. So I built this about uh, 2008. That's my uh, printer over here. It's a 64 inch Epson printer and my computers and my hard drives and so forth. Everything here is on wheels so it can wheel around. Just gonna give you a little bit of a 360 of the space and tell me if you can't see anything or it looks weird or whatever. Uh, Great. And um, in the middle is this table. It's a uh, six by 12 feet and it's got a cutting surface on it. That's what I put the prints on and cut them up if I need to. And let's see, walk around this. We don't do these walls. Uh, the walls are about, this is about almost 40 feet. The stuff that's on here right now is stuff I've been working on. I didn't change anything up for this visit. Um, I'll talk about the stuff a little more if you want in a minute. These are sculptures actually I'm working on right now. I can tell you more about them in, in a bit. And then um, over on this side, um, I'm making a series of Saguaro color pictures. So I'm sticking them up just to take a look at them. These are 30 by 40 ish size. This um, printer and this setup here is my wife's, Emily Mattias, and she does her printing back here too. Although I've kind of taken over the walls for the time being. And then, um, then over on this side, I've got, there's actually a, a small bathroom. There's a lot of light coming in from the doors. And then there's this sort of library sitting area where um, the people come in to visit. I, uh, you know, we, we chat and maybe have a beer or something like that. So that's this particular room. There's actually two more rooms, but maybe, um, oops, I'm getting a message here from Keynote. Sorry, because I hit something wrong. <laughs> There we go. Okay, back at uh, Zoom again. And anyway, so that that's a little bit of the space. What would how would you like to proceed, Jordan? Um, I was thinking maybe we could uh, take a look a little bit about your practice. I had a couple questions for you, and I know that uh, the audience probably has some questions. So I know you had some uh, slides on Keynote prepared. So maybe we could dive into that. Sure. And then <clears throat> I know I didn't explain any, any of the stuff that's on the wall. So if you want to do that, like I get a lot of questions about this stuff that's behind me, these sticks, and I'm happy to talk about that too, or, or the sculptures I was talking about over here. So Great. anyway, yeah, whatever you want to do, we'll just proceed. So what would, what would you like? Uh, so I, I guess I could start with a question for you. So since we just did a uh, landscape lecture last week, I was wondering if we could just hear more about your approach to photographing the landscape and um, what initially drew you to that type of work. Landscape? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, initially I didn't ever think I would be a landscape photographer. Um, I did uh, have an interest in being out in the land because I studied geology 
And uh, the reason why I chose that as a major was I thought, well, it might be a good way to get outside. So I did. But then when I, when I was working um, in geology, which I, I did for a couple of years when I was in graduate school, it just didn't occur to me that maybe making landscape photographs would be interesting because I thought being out on the land was interesting, but landscape photographs were, I thought, pretty boring. You know, if it, if it was just about rocks and trees and stuff, I didn't, it wasn't motivating me to, to, to do that. Um, but I s slowly came around. <laughs> and I guess the, the thing that really brought me around was uh, the, doing the um, rephotographic survey project. Which, which was a, I guess that I was interested in the conceptual idea of, you know, of doing that project. And then my colleagues, um, Ellen Manchester and Joanne Berberg, um, you know, we combined these interesting, or in, we combined our interests in photo history, conceptual art and physical change. And it sort of made more sense to me after a while. Uh, so, I, I still, in some ways, I still hesitate to call myself a landscape photographer because I think it's easy to um, define that too narrowly. Uh, I, I think, um, you know, I certainly have an interest in landscape and land and place, but I'm equally interested in time and uh, the way we perceive that. I'm interested in technology. I'm interested in what people's experience has been in on the land and what they've done to it. And so it's, it's kind of a merger of a lot of different things, um, not simply pictures of, of, uh, of the land itself. I don't know if I'm getting at your question or not. Uh, yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, and um, I guess I'm already getting some, uh, some questions about the sculptural work too. Sure. Well, let me, let me, um, <laughs> let me kind of, kind of address some of that stuff because I kind of went by it really quickly. Uh, I'm going to show you this wall right here. Uh, these, you get a sense of it. These are sticks. <laughs> I call them sticks. They're sunrise sticks. It's a part of a game that we play um, when we're out camping. And they're, um, what I do is I take a, a, I draw a circle in the dirt that's about six feet in diameter. Uh, I put a stick in the middle of it at night, and then everybody tries to put a marker on the circle where they think the first rays of the sun are going to come up and hit the hit the stick, and then create a intersection with the with the circle. And so it's just kind of a way that we, when we were trying to guess where the sun was going to come up, of settling the arguments about where the sun was going to be. And so these reflect, you know, the stuff that I find out when I'm on the trip, you know, so like this is a part from a downed airplane uh, with some nails and the stick that I found in the same place. So they kind of, they're kind of adorned with um, objects from, from the journey. Uh, this was actually, a, unfortunately, a, a can and a little marker that was found at the site of where um, someone died in the desert trying to cross. And then this, this one is um, like bottle caps, but it kind of makes a sound like a rattlesnake. So, you know, I mean, it, they're all kind of a little bit different. And I've got them all over the place. Like there, you see them on tops of the atrium where the windows are and on the opposite wall and so forth. Uh, so I've got about 300 of them right now. And so they're, they're, um, they're part of that, that idea of the sunrise stick game. But I, I think they're really cool. I love making them. I make them out in the desert around the campfire. Uh, and I think in a lot of ways they relate to the saguaros. Um, related to that, let me, let me just do you a little bit more. Like these, there are these two pictures right here. Um, these are basically about six feet tall um, portraits. They're two, they're actually a stereo pair. So I'm, what I'm doing recently is I'm making stereo pairs the idea is you can get up, you know, really close to these and, you know, see incredible detail because they're made with a really high resolution digital back. And then there's also um, this thing right here, which is the stereo viewer. And 
it's kind of a takeoff on a 19th century Wheatstone viewer. And you stand back about 15, 20 feet and you look through the hole. I can't show it to you in stereo, but you look through the two holes with your eyes and you see this, these two images in stereo. So it's, it's uh, it actually very effective, it works very well. I'm also making stereos for uh, these viewers. You can see them here. These are professional uh, called light Sokia viewers they use for aerial photography. And I'm making stereos for them. And so, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm kind of, there's a reason for that. And I, I have a picture I could show you. It's uh, the, my father was a stereo photographer. He made um, stereo pictures of our family when I was growing up. Uh, from, he started, he bought a stereo camera in 1949 and he used it until 1984. Some like my whole childhood is done in, in stereo photography. So I've kind of had a history with it. And I'm going back to it recently because I'm just kind of curious about it. And then these objects here, these, these sculptural pieces, they're actually um, objects that I found in the desert. So I've been collecting stuff in the desert, stuff that doesn't go on the sticks. I mean, I put them in, and I'm just, I'm, you know, this is a kind of a, it's been a good thing for me to do during the COVID uh, pandemic here because I can just do it in the studio, but I'm trying to put together a, a objects either in relationships to each other or um, by themselves. The objects I think are, are indicative of culture and our relationship to, to things and, and I see them as artifacts, uh, more or less contemporary artifacts. This is uh, Columbia Records, the free will in Bob Dylan, you know, and it's just got other things like the, there's a broken billiard ball, a golf ball, you know. Some of these are, um, I'm working with lighting, like these are two, I don't know if you can see that or not, they're, um, they're, they're little lights I get from Ikea, and I lit up just like a broken glass part from a car, or a, the handle from a jug, you know, stuff like that. This is a bottle that's been melted in a campfire and welded onto the rock that it was, put in, you know, and, and uh, this, there's some of the stuff from the bombing range, like this is um, a, a 30 millimeter um, shell from a, a A10, actually, a tank killer. And it's put next to a shard, a broken plate shard of the Washington Monument. Um, and so, you know, I mean, these are just like things that, I mean, here's like the this uh, collection of different caliber bullets from the bombing range and uh, you know, a tray that's been all shot up or this is a cell phone that got totally ruined and it's got a light raking across it. So, I mean, there's just stuff like that. This is a, <laughs> this is a weird one. This is a, a mannequin that was used for a target. Um, so, I mean, I'm trying to figure out how to display these things, how to put them together, how to create relationships, stuff like that. So, uh, you know, that, that's where the sculptural stuff is. And it's a kind of, a, I'm enjoying working with it right now because as we all know, I can't get out as much as we used to, um, but I have a pretty good collection of this stuff. So it's, it's good for me to work with. And some of it comes from just stuff that people have been leaving out there and discarding. Some of it's stuff from shooting sites, some of it's stuff from the Barry Goldwater bombing range, some of it's, you know, various locations, but I think it's, it, it all, sort of has a, a metaphoric or symbolic, you know, content to related to the pictures, you know, frankly. Yeah. Okay. So I forget where we were, but, but I just feel a little better about showing you what this stuff, weird stuff is I got in the studio here. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. What else you got? Um, so I have two questions already for you. So one of them is, can you elaborate on your interest in time? Yeah. Um, well, I guess I always knew that um, time and place go together. You know, I mean, they're really, you can't separate them. And when, when I was working on the rephotographic survey, uh, it, it, one of the major things that came out of that process was an understanding about change. Um, you know, that, that, uh, you could see the, the first picture made in the 19th century and the second picture, the rephotograph that we were making, you look at the two together and you say, oh, this has changed or that's changed uh, because of the passage of time, 
you know, the pictures don't explain what, you know, caused the change. Um, they don't explain it, but, but they do um, give you access to seeing what that is. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, that, that got me interested in this idea of the relationship between time and change. Um, and over the years, the different projects I've done that deal with uh, brief photography or historic imagery in some form or other have been um, structures to allow me to explore a little bit more of that relationship. Uh, and it's not always been change. Um, sometimes it's actually also the idea of maybe duration. Uh, you know, how, how do we experience time as, as a, a duration um, as opposed to a single moment, you know, and how does photography capture uh, either a single moment or a duration in time. And, and so th those are things that um, I guess I've moved into. And as I've gotten older, uh, it, the idea of time has gotten more pertinent to me, I guess. I, I just think that as you get older, that's probably going to happen. You're going to think a little bit about how much time you got left and stuff like that. And I think it, it's, uh, it's something that's come to the forefront more than even place at this point in my practice. So a lot of the projects that, that I take on have to do with uh, that, that concept of, of um, the relationship between time and photography, change, duration, and you know, things that, that we experience uh, or we can experience through different, um, different methods and different, using different methods in different ways in photography. Great. So I think I'm getting a couple questions about the birthday portraits and about the re-photographic survey. So I was thinking maybe we could dive into some of the slides. Sure. So let me um, let me go to some slides now. I'm gonna find it again. Here we go. Okay. Uh, let me zoom. Let me. This is all a bunch of stuff here on this uh, slideshow. I'll start with a re-photographic survey. And you can see that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, well, that, well <laughs> that's me back in the day taking a picture of uh, Old Faithful on Yellowstone. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's a pretty simple idea, right? It, you take this picture, this by O'Sullivan, and you try to go back to the same spot and find the same thing. And then just make a diptych out of it. So it seems like a simple idea and I think it's been done a lot now. Uh, there's all kinds of then and now type books in different places. But I, I think in the late 1970s, this, this was a more of a um, radical idea. Uh, you know, there's a lot of change. I mean, like the, um, the previous image showed urban change. This shows urban change too. This is Salt Lake City, um, Timothy O'Sullivan on the left and 1868, 69, and so I can't remember the exact date. And then the re uh, later, showing the city moving out to the camera position. The other big change was water in the, in the West. I mean, you know, uh, one of the biggest changes in the American West has to do with water and the uh, impounding and transportation of water and so forth. So, you know, I think the project was good at documenting that kind of thing. I, I would I said that there was four themes that came out of rephotography for me. You know, one was the documentation of physical change. Um, the other was examining the history of the view and how it was made, and also about something more about the maker of the view. Um, the third thing was you know art practice, conceptual art strategies, and methods of representation. How do you use the tools and create a structure? a conceptual structure under which you can relate two pictures and understand their relationships. And then the third or the last thing was like understanding the view and context, uh, context to the, um, to the medium, context to the culture and changes in the culture and how it might've been seen at one time versus another and things like that. So those, those were really important kind of themes. Um, then the other, uh, let's see, the other question, birthday portraits. Yeah. You go down to them here, got them in here somewhere. Here we go. Um, yeah, this is, so this had a lot to do with time and change uh, specifically. And it was something that I didn't um, plan in the beginning, but the, 
the, the, the whole thing started because my daughter, uh, Lena, my oldest daughter, uh, was born on my 32nd, my, my 39th birthday. So we share a birthday. We were born on the same day, 39 years apart. And so when she turned one and I turned 40, uh, we thought it'd be cool to make a picture in the backyard. So my wife, Emily, helps out with this. I set the camera up and pose. And then in this case, a squirming, you know, one-year-old. And, and she presses the shutter. And then we do it a number of times so we get something that looks good. We used to do it on Polaroid film. And, then, and so this was the first one. And then, and then we did it the second year. We thought, oh, it's, you know, let's do it again. And, you know, we did it again. And then by the third year, we were thinking maybe this is starting to be a little series. I, I hadn't really thought of it um, in the beginning as a series. And, um, you know, I, so we did it. I, I was not intending to show anybody this series. Uh, it was just for us uh, and a few friends. I gave it to my parents. I gave it to some other friends of ours that, you know, were, were interested in, in us as a family. Um, here she's four, you know. And she, I like this one a lot. She's five. And, you know, um, so what was happening uh, was that, you know, this is one year apart, 365 days. And I think there's just a tremendous amount of growth and change in Lena. Every year, she's changing a lot. And as I like to say, I was trying to say the same. Uh, I think, you know, I, at least I wasn't staying the same, but at least I had, um, I don't think it's changing as much as her, at least at this point. So she's changing a lot. And every year for her, I would say she had a, a pretty amazing sense of time because uh, she was, uh, that 365 days is a lot for a kid. You know, for, for me, it doesn't mean as much, you know, I mean, it's just another year. Uh, she's nine at this point. This is done in the backyard, and we used to do it around the same place. Um, you know, the, there's a swing, a rope swing we have, and we used to do it there. And then later, when she got bigger, we did it on a chair. Uh, so I would say that even though th that we lived the same amount of time, I, I think that our experience of time was radically different. You know, her her thinking about what a year meant and my thinking and this kind of brings up the idea of what time is. I mean, is time just a matter of the clock or is it a matter of the experience? You know, um, here she's 12. And at the same time, I was, one of the reasons I kind of didn't show this for a long time is I was really aware of Nick Nixon's series, you know, of, of the Brown sisters and think it's a, you know, incredible and interesting series. Um, and so, you know, I didn't, I still didn't think about exhibiting this and I, and I really haven't exhibited it very much. Um, but um, now that it started to get going, it, by at this point, it was really starting to be a series and it mattered a lot to me because it was a record of our, of our lives. And, but still, uh, it wasn't something I thought about um, showing to a lot of people and I didn't, you know. Um, th this is uh, 13. You can see she's getting into teenager. This, this is the one <laughs> that, uh, where I started to see some differences, you know, because I mean, look at the separation between us at this point, you know, if you look at that one to that one, you know, there's, there's a little spread there. And, you know, she's 14 at this point. And um, so, you know, things are happening in her life. And she's 15. And, you know, I'm realizing that if I look back on these, now I'm in my 50s, you know, that, that, uh, that I'm, I am starting to change, you know, and she's changing a lot still, and, I, and I'm starting to change too, and I'm starting to understand that. She's 16. I mean, I was always changing, but I just wasn't always changing maybe as quickly. Uh, so as we get further on this series, um, and she gets into her late teens, I think I'm starting to look a little older here. And I didn't, I can't read the date on this, I can't remember where we are right now. Uh, in the numbers, so she's 20 in this one. Okay, so here she's 20. And one of the questions that I got about this series, Mark, is what made you end the birthday portrait series? Is it still uh, ongoing? It's not ended. Okay, great. It's still going, yeah. It's an ongoing series. This, it's my longest uh, series, actually, at this point. So she's 21 and I'm 60, so 
this is the only one we didn't do in the backyard because we had to do it in Colorado because we were go going to a family wedding at the time. We try to do this on our birthday, September 9th, but um, there's uh, some days where you had to move it because uh, she was going to school. She went to Kansas City Art Institute uh, for undergraduate school. And uh, so she had to leave and so we do it a little bit early sometimes. So it, they're close, but most of them are on the ninth if we can do it. Uh, she's 23 at this point, uh, 24. And, you know, I, I think there's this look on her face that she's really, she's a very mature, I think, individual at this point. Um, and she really has a sense of her own person. She, uh, at this point, she also uh, is, is a graduate student at, at ASU here where I teach, and she's a fiber artist, and she finished her MFA uh, last year. And so then, this is the most recent one. This was the uh, one that we did last September. So, and what I began to understand, you know, a little, maybe five years ago or something, it was pretty obvious when I looked at the pictures that, you know, her rate of change was um, slowing down. Uh, I mean, she was maturing now that she's in her twenties. And of course we're both still changing, but she's, the rate of her change has begun to level off a little bit and she's reaching maturity. My rate of change is beginning to increase <laughs> as I get older. Uh, and that crossover, um, I'm really fascinated about, you know, it's the one thing that troubles her a little bit uh, about this because I think she understand, we both understand that it's about mortality. And she doesn't like to think about that. She doesn't like to think about my mortality, but I'm fascinated about it because, and that's why I decided it was worth actually beginning to show people because of that crossover, because of that idea of mortality. And I could talk about that because it's me. I'm the guy who's, you know, going down <laughs> at this point, or at least, you know, that's where I'm headed uh, in that part of my life. Um, and yeah, I think it's a beautiful statement about that, about this the generational thing. So I'm my intention is to keep this up as long as we can. Um, and if she moves away somewhere, I'll go to see her on the on her birthday and on our birthday and we'll try to make it work. I think she's she understands the meaning of it and she's totally a participant uh, in this. My wife has been a big participant and so the family's been involved, you know, in this. Um, not my youngest daughter, but because she's not around right now. She's in Philly, but um, anyway, she, you know, this is part of uh, our life. So I guess th maybe that gives you some idea about the, that project. I hope that it answers a question about it. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I, we have a few more questions about the re-photographic survey. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one that we got is, um, well, one of them that I know that you were using the Type 55, um, the Type 55 Polaroid film for that. And I, there's a couple other questions about the equipment that you're using. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and maybe how that has shifted as the technology has changed. Yeah, sure. Can I go back to my, my uh, screen a little bit? Um, I had a, uh, couple slides in here, I think. Yeah, I had, well, I had that one of me standing there <laughs> with the ranger. I guess this is me too. This is, uh, this is how I used to work. Uh, uh, my camera set up, I was photographing a log book there, but I got a Polaroid, sheet of Polaroid film in my hand and down below my uh, bucket there with a Polaroid uh, film used to go into, but I got short shorts on, that was a while ago. Uh, but anyway, yeah, you mean you, so basically with this Polaroid type 55, you know, you use a holder on a regular four by five, you uh, take the picture, put it to the holder and it processes it. You, um, oh, that's revealing territory. Wait a minute, let me see where I'm at here for a second. Oh, here it is over here. So let me go through here. There, it, you produce these series of positive prints. Uh, the prints are just really uh, proofs. Um, they're not great. They're they're usually blown out on the highlights, and they're you know they're not 
they're not the sharpest things, but they're, they're good to know your composition and know the lighting and, you know, know that your exposure is any good, stuff like that. You used to have to overexpose it to get a good negative, but I used to, and you have to coat the prints with this sticky plastic stuff. And uh, you put the negative into a bucket and that's what the negative looks like there. And, you know, it's got these kind of funky edges on it where there's a paper separator between the negative and the positive and uh, that that would um, stay there and eventually i printed that i decided to print it um, so when you saw a picture like this from revealing territory um, then you could see the edges you can see around the top and the bottom and the sides you get that kind of funky edge i decided to leave that that there so i used this film for um from well, I started using it with a rephotographic survey project in, in uh, 1977 because it was a great material to use when we were still on the field to check our position and to do measurements from the prints and to know that when you left the site, you had something usable, you know. And then later, I mean, Polaroid at that time was not was making a ton of money. And then in the late 70s, they would just give us the film. We had crates of it, you know, and so I had more than I needed to use for the project. So I started using it for myself. And so I started to make pictures on it. So I used that until uh, 1994, approximately, uh, or no, I'm sorry, 2004. I used it up until 2004. Um, and uh, then after that, everybody knows the Polaroid went under. And so they, you know, it's not, being made anymore, although I guess the impossible project is starting to uh, make some of it. I haven't tried it, but it's a re real expensive. So um, let me go back to stop sharing here. If I can get my find where my mouse is. What happened here to my mouse? Oh, I know I got to do that. Okay, and then um, let me uh, show you what I'm using now. I got it over here. Oh, wait a minute, where is it? It's over here. Got to walk around the studio again. I, I have the current system I'm using right now. Um, I don't know if you can see that very well or not. Mm -hmm. This is, um, it's an Arca Swiss Factum camera with a Schneider lens. And then on the back of it, let me, I can just rotate it here. On the back of it is a digital back. It's a phase one. Um, IQ3 100 megapixel trichromatic back. So it does 100 megapixel image. The camera body itself has movements. I can do rise and fall like a view camera. I'm sorry, so I can do shift like a view camera. I mean, tilt and swing. I can do rise and fall on the back. And, um, and I have, and if, if I rotate the thing, I can do swing. So I can get view camera movements the lens is a digital lens, the Schneider, this is the wide angle um, on it right now. So in a lot of ways, this setup right here is pretty much the digital equivalent of what I showed in that picture with me with the bucket, you know, mm -hmm. with a four by five. So this is um, kind of, it's, I can do the same thing. I mean, I can do view camera movements, um, you know, and I can, get an incredibly sharp image. That's why, you know, I can make images like these that are, you know, six feet tall and they look incredibly sharp. It's actually better than the, than the four by five. And I get an instant uh, image out of it. So I can see what I'm doing, like just like anybody with a digital camera and I can do live view and I can compose and I can do things on it. Uh, so instead of using a ground glass, I use live view. I can zoom into 100%, check the focus and so forth. So it's in some ways, it's a lot like using the Polaroid. I can see what I'm getting before I leave the site. So it was an easy transition for me to move from one to the other. The transition to that equipment that I just showed was not um, instant. You know, I, I moved from, I first bought really small point and shoot digital cameras, got familiar with the medium. Um, I understood the, the software and, and how to use things um, and then moved into my first um, high resolution digital back in 2007 and it was 28 megapixel and then over time I just traded up it's kind of like buying a car and then you trade up to the next model and the next model and so forth so I've gotten went from 28 
to 56 megapixels to 80 megapixels to 100 megapixels. So it's kind of been, you know, done in, done in stages. And as I've been able to make work and sell work and so forth, I've put the money back into the into the um, material. So that that's the that's the technical side of things. Yeah. Great. Uh, so I have a question here. I think you answered all the technical questions that were coming in too. Um, okay. Can you discuss the role of collaboration in your work and how yeah. working on projects like the re-photographic survey has affected your solo practice? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, because uh, in my, I think in my practice or my career, I've sort of split my practice into two parts and um, depending on the timing, it's either been one or the other, but I, so I have an individual practice where, you know, I, I make just pictures by myself and of my, you know, of my own volition and, you know, so forth. It's just my own design. But then I also work in collaboration with other people. And I found that to be an incredibly important part of my practice. And, and when I mentioned the rephotographic survey, that of course was collaborative. I, I mentioned Ellen and Joanne, but there was Gordy Bashaw and Rick Dingus. And, you know, there were, there were a bunch of us that worked on that for a period of three years. That was my introduction to um, collaboration and what um, collaboration could be like. I liked it. And so as I've continued throughout my career, um, I've found various partners to collaborate with. Sometimes they've been writers. Uh, I've you know worked with the ethnobotanist like Gary Navin or a historian like Philip Fradkin, uh, you know, Rebecca Solnit. I've done a number of projects with, with Rebecca. Um, Bill Fox, a writer, um, and he and I have done several projects. And so, and then of course, I think the main collaborator for me in the last 20 years, the person I've worked with mostly or most often with has been Byron Wolf. And, you know, Byron um, I, and I first met because he was a student here at ASU and he, he came to work with me. Uh, and I, I was quick to learn, uh, Byron has a lot of special skills and in and, and things like technology, but also his thinking is very creative and, you know, he's just an kind of amazing individual. And so we got involved in projects when he was a student and including, including Third View, which is the remake of the Rephotographic Survey project that took place between uh, 1997 and, and um, 2000. And we together, all the, the group of us at that time, there was, there was five, like five people working on that project. Um, Byron did an amazing job, you know, programming the DVD that we put out with the book that we, that we produced. And, and he and I worked very closely on the content of that um, disc. And ever since then, um, you know, we've just found that we like working together. I find it very stimulating to work with somebody um, who can come up with ideas that you can't, you know, and when you work uh, together, that what happens is the product that you come up with is your joint product. It's, it doesn't belong to any individual, but it belongs to you both or you as a group, whoever you are. Um, but at the same time, you're working on that product. You're learning things that you take from that and you move to the other work that you do. Um, so, you know, I, the, the stuff that I was learning working with Byron um, on the, the Third View project, for example, we were getting better and better at, at doing digital stuff. I mean, we started out that project, it was all analog. We were using Polaroid film and, and, and shooting as we had done, you know, 20 years before for the rephotographic survey. But then we were scanning things. I actually bought a drum scanner so I could, I could you know, scan stuff. Uh, I was learning, I was getting better and better at using software like Photoshop, which everybody uses now, but it was something that, you know, we were using Photoshop too, you know, a lot of people didn't know anything about it and there wasn't any way to, way to learn it because, um, you know, there, there wasn't a lot of stuff on the web at that time. So, you know, we, we were, you know, I was enhancing my learning by through the collaborative process. Later we went, we collaborated together on the project in Yosemite with, with Rebecca Solnit and a project called Yosemite in Time. And that was also a hybrid project between film and digital. And uh, 
you know, it, it ended up that we were making digital prints because at that point we could get a decent printer and start printing from this and I could make some good scans off of, off of our film with my scanner. So we were learning how to make prints and then we were like, hey, you know what we can do with Photoshop? We can embed stuff, we can use layers because it's a new thing and, you know, what else can we do with this kind of thing? And so, you know, Byron and I just kind of got into, um, you know, challenging each other to think about what else we could do and how did this open up ideas? And, and that was enlarging my personal practice at the same time it was, you know, working together with him. And I think it was doing the same thing for him too. So we still collaborate together. We, we haven't got a project at the moment, although we have done some work. We, we uh, were in Yosemite together in, uh, in September and we worked on creating stereos. Actually, we, we did this, I think it's gonna be a very cool stereo. Uh, one half of the stereo Byron did as a video from Glacier Point of mostly you're looking at Half Dome, but in the corner, there's a woman painting a picture of Half Dome in the other corner, there's a guy doing selfies with a selfie stick. And then I'm like a couple hundred meters away photographing Half Dome with my camera. It's a static image, but because it, they're several hundred meters apart, you get the stereo view of Half Dome. But so the idea is we're gonna have this image of, you know, it's on a video monitor, you know, a 55 inch or 60 inch video screen. And then we're going to have a similar print scale to the same size. And you get, you look through the viewer and you can see it in stereo. I mean, it's stuff like that, that we're just playing with. We don't know where it's going to go, but it's just the kind of stuff that we like to play. And, and so one of the things that's important to me about collaboration, and if it works really well, is you get to play, you know, try something out. And then nobody gets the blame if it doesn't work. And if it does work, you got to share it. But that's, who cares? That's cool. Yeah. Great. Um, so, I was one. I know that there was a uh, a book in the works, so I was wondering if we could maybe uh, take a look about at that and hear a little bit about the process that you go through in terms of sequencing and just how you think about uh, book projects. Yeah, uh, there is a there is a couple of books in the works actually right now for me, but the one that um, is happening quick the most quickly is. Uh, it's a 40 year retrospective book called Seeing Time. I'm gonna to go to the share screen again, if that's okay. I'm gonna show you a little bit. Uh, where is it? Okay, here it is. Um, this is from the PDF from the book. And um, that's the cover, Seeing Time. Oh, can I not get this to, let me see if I can, I have to, uh, okay, there we go. Um, this is, uh, it's a book by University of Texas Press. I'm opening the book up now, 40 years. It's kind of a retrospective or is a retrospective. Uh, it's got interviews by Ann Tucker from Houston Museum of Fine Arts, from Keith Davis from the Nelson Museum and Becky Sam from uh, CCP. And it's uh, gonna be a real doorstop. I mean, it's like 480 pages, it's unbelievable. So there's the contents. It's got, I think, 13 different projects in it. So this is a little bit different book for me than what I've been doing more recently, um, because this is sort of, I would think of as a more conventional process of working with a publisher like um, University of Texas Press which has been absolutely wonderful. Uh, these guys have been great to work with. Uh, you know, they've just been bending over backwards trying to get this to be the best book they can make. And um, the former director is retired. Uh, Dave Hamrick, you know, came to me with this concept and, you know, I just really give him a lot of credit because he's just done an amazing job trying to make this the best that they can produce. And they, there's, um, They've had a great book designer, Matt Avery, work on this, and Matt's been, I think, doing a fantastic job. So, but this is a little bit different than some of the other books that I've done, say with Radius, um, which, you know, the, the, or I should say this book is really meant to be a compilation of work that, you know, I've done, um, you know, for 40 years, and it's gonna include some of the Sunrise Sticks. So this is some of the pages from the Sunrise Stick game. And it kind of ends the book with, uh, Saguaros, and I think they're kind of related. So, in fact, a lot of these sticks are made from saguaros. So it's so you see a bunch of these 
opening the book. And then um, that's a hundred of them on an installation I did. Starts with the Rephotographic Survey Project. And so it goes through that. And, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of chronological in that sense. Um, but um, when I work with other books, like with Radius, uh, and I work with a designer, David Chickey, I think what happens with, with those books is that a lot of times I go into the book not really knowing what, how the book should be put together in terms of sequencing and stuff like that. I think in this book, it, the idea of sequencing was a little more natural because we could just do it chronologically for the most part. First this project, then this project and so forth. And I think that makes sense. Um, the image selection came from me, but the actual, uh, it was some input from input from Anne and, and you know, from Dave Hamrick and some others, um, uh, what should be chosen. But when I work with um, Radius, for example, a lot of times that those projects I don't have a very good sense of how the work should come together. Um, so maybe I can leave this one. I can, I mean, I, there's a whole lot I can show you there, but I don't think you want to look through 480 pages, but uh, let me go to the, the um, keynote again. And I'm just going to go scroll down to that project somewhere. Yeah. Um, So Drowned River with Radius was an example of, you know, I've done, what, four books with Radius, I guess, and, and David Chicky. When Rebecca and Byron and I worked on this project, we didn't really have a very clear idea of what the message was or how to put it together visually. Um, the message got focused because uh, Rebecca finally, um, when she had the time to do it, she did a project for California Sunny Magazine and uh, wrote an essay about Lake Powell. And uh, that gave her the focus she needed to then put it into this book in, in a more extended form. This book was a reference to this book. So it was a book about a book. Uh, this book by Elliot Porter called The Place No One Knew, Glen Canyon on the Colorado. And this came out in 1963, Sierra Club. And um, this is a very important book because even though a lot of people don't know it now, or don't know the book unless you're an aficionado, aficionado in photography. Um, this was one of the first color books that uh, photo books that came out. Uh, the, the Sierra Club bankrolled it. Um, there was a lot of speculation and uncertainty about whether they should do that, but it was hugely successful. And it, it actually was they had a message, which was that they should never have built a dam in Glen Canyon. And um, and we should stop any future dam building. And in fact, they were able to do that. I mean, the book actually had a great effect. We reproduced a part of the book in our book because we realized most people might not have seen it. And then this little illustration kind of indicates if you don't know where I'm talking about, uh, this little uh, thing we'll zoom into, Glen Canyon Dam here, right between the border of Utah and Arizona. So this is the, this is the dam that created the lake created Lake Powell, which you see here about 150 kilometers long, more shoreline than California. And um, this is in the middle of the desert, but this is a big storage um, lake and it's also a reservoir and it um, also generates power that's really out there in a, in a lo remote location. But what's happening now is the lake's going down, here's the dam, it's going down and down and it's one of the reasons it's going down is because of the drought I mean, the drought's been exacerbated by climate change. So when we didn't know what we were doing with this work, uh, but we knew we had a book in some form or other, but we didn't know how to edit it. We brought it to David Chickie and that's David there at uh, Radius. And David had us bring in all the pictures and we laid them all out and we had a long discussion about it and we couldn't figure out what we were doing. And David said, you guys go away and come back tomorrow at noon and I'll have something for you. And that's him with some PDFs so on. Here, okay, here's what I got for you. And basically what he was able to do is understand the metaphor and the work and put it together. This is um, our reproduction of, of Valley Porter and then the title page for our book and, and how we thought about it. And it's, it's really a message about climate change 
Um, you know, these are some of the pictures that are in the book. Now, these pictures were made by both Byron and me. Uh, we decided not to attribute the photographs in the book because when we work collaboratively, they're both ours. You know, you, you know, I might have made this picture, which I did because that's Byron standing in the picture, but it's still both of ours. Um, and then this is a case where there's text with the pictures. And we use the Porter book as a way to mirror our book. So the book design reflects um, Porter's book to some degree. But what David was able to do was uh, put together a design that, that gave it a metaphor and to focus what we were able to do. And the way the books lay out is kind of like this. You're seeing two page spread and the gutter would be in the middle or it would be on the left side or actually it would be on the left or right side because this is two pages, two images per page. So I'm not actually showing you the gutter here, but you'd be seeing four in a row. So, you know, the, he, so what happens in some cases with, book, with books for me is that the books um, begin to be the primary vehicle for the project. And this was one, I'd say the other book, the other books I've done with, with Radius are like that. El Camino del Diablo, um, the Saguaro's book, and also Half-Life of History um, is also uh, one that's like that. So, you know, this is this is the, um, an example of how we might work together and how the design of the book actually creates uh, the, ultimately the understanding. I'm showing you individual pictures here, but they're really not shown that way in the book. This is a two page spread, a rephotograph of, of two years apart. Um, and in the end of Lake Powell, so you can see the growth reoccurring. Uh, and as um, Rebecca says that this uh, will be a river once again. She says it much more eloquently than I can say it, but <laughs> that's the message anyway. Now, we did have an exhibition of this work at the Center for Creative Photography. It was in a larger show that uh, Becky Sam put together uh, down there, but this was an installation view, uh, which was done. The installation was actually influenced by the book. And so that this actually takes some of the book pages and puts them on the wall. So the book came first before the exhibition which I think kind of indicates in some ways the way that I would work, you know, with, uh, with a book in this form. Okay. So wow. I'll stop sharing there. So since we have about 10 minutes left, I wanted to make sure we had some time to like get a full studio tour. I know you had some, uh, some prints that were uh, rested up against the wall. Like there was a Timothy O'Sullivan that I thought was really interesting. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sure. Them. Well, um, yeah, I just, I think I showed you that, I uh, had, you know, I've been making these Saguaro pictures and then, but there's actually based on some historical precedents, like that's a Timothy O'Sullivan photograph there on the right, which I think is still the first intentional photograph of a Saguaro. And then there are these other botanical images from other sources that come from the um, mid 19th century. So they're the earliest forms of Saguaro. So I'm still, you know, looking for, for Saguaro um, examples. So these are just a few that I'm working on right now. I just printed recently. Okay, so I'm about to go into this other room off the main gallery, or off the main production room here in the studio. This is a storage room and uh, it's more empty than not right now, but that's because I need to move stuff into it from school. I have a lot of stuff at school where I've had my dark room set up for a long time. Over here, I have uh, flat files. These came from the library when they um, got rid of their stuff and they were redoing the library. So I got a really good deal on these. But, and then uh, over here, I have some stuff on the walls because I just don't know where to put it. But these are you know, industrial shelvings. I have, I have um, uh, matted and framed prints on. I try not to keep matted and framed prints in the studio because I don't know what to do with them. So I, I don't tend to mat and frame my own work, but if, if it comes back from a show that way, I'll store it. And my wife has stuff in here too. So we have multiple storage units here. Uh, that there's gonna be more, because like I said, I gotta bring stuff back from the studio. And then over here, I have a, a copy set up. So I'm in the middle of copying. Um, using the digital back, I'm copying my four by five negatives so I can make um, prints from them in the future from those instead of the scanner, because my scanner gave up finally, died on me. And then this room here, this is the shop. 
And I built this, all this stuff was built in about two years ago. And it got finished last year. This is uh, where I have tools and I work on the sculptures and stuff. I have saws, I have a table saw outside and just small tools, hand tools in here. And then this space over here, um, which is largely empty at the moment, but this is where my daughter Lena works. Uh, normally she has a studio set up here, but because of the Corona virus, she's living in, she lives in Phoenix and she just decided she didn't want to um, imperil the old folks here, but with her presence very much. So she comes over to visit once in a while, but she doesn't work in the studio. So, which uh, is nice of her, but I'm, I'm not so worried about it, but she's worried about it. So, so that's the back room uh, here. And so it's mostly a storage in the shop area. So that altogether is 2,100 square feet. And it's um, in the backyard of my house. And so I'll just look out the window here. I don't know if you can see. Uh, so Mark, is this where you, essentially in the same space as where you were used to take the birthday portraits? Yeah, and it's just back there towards the house. Well, um, thanks for being <laughs> back with us, Mark. Unfortunately, yeah. we were uh, interrupted before and there was a few questions that came in from the audience that we didn't get to ask you. So we thought it would be a good time to kind of run through some of those and properly wrap this up. Okay. So, sure. Again. Well, let's, let's try to do that then. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So one of the questions that came in was from um, Margaret Lejeune. And she asked, um, how do you foresee the current pandemic affecting your practice? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know if I have a real good answer because everybody's trying to figure that kind of stuff out, you know, themselves. And I guess I would say that there's maybe a short term solution to, or answer to that and a long term solution. Um, I'm to concentrate on the what's happening now um, and make the best of the time that I can now. Um, and so there, the short term, I guess, for this would be that I'm working in the studio. Uh, I'm lucky to have a studio I can work in. And I have a, a buildup of a lot of images that I haven't been able to print yet. So I'm working on that. Um, I had a little trouble getting paper recently, but I got, got the paper finally. And uh, so I'm able to print. And I'm also, as I discussed earlier, I'm working on uh, objects. So I've got a, boxes of stuff I've sort of salted away from the years and I'm playing with that. So those are the short term things where I'm kind of caught here and I can't go out and do the kinds of things I'd like to do, you know, that are out in the field or so forth. And, and then the longer term, what I hope will be that um, at some point, travel restrictions and the stay in place orders will be um, lifted and I'll be able to get out and do more of the stuff that, uh, you know, I, I'd like to do in the desert and, and um, you know, be able to, to make images and be out there and not just the desert, but in the summer and other locations too. And I do, I really do miss being out. I think that's um, something I, when I think about it, I kind of miss terribly. And, and uh, when I um, think ahead, I'd like to, you know, be out there and do that. So I would say that, but the long term, I mean, maybe Margaret's question is like, do, does she ask, you know, if, if it'll change my practice in any permanent way? And I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, I do think that it's the timing of the pandemic and my interest in three-dimensional objects and sculpture and things like that might produce a little more long-lasting interest in me and doing something a little bit else. Um, it might also, I think the other thing that I was thinking about last night is that, uh, you know, that we're, we're concentrating now on the, on the coronavirus and the pandemic that we have, but the other great threat that we face these days is climate change. And, you know, I did, I did work on that, the book Drowned River with Byron Wolf and Rebecca Solnit that was in a, in a sense, um, in a book about uh, climate change. 
And I've been thinking that that's something that maybe uh, if I have limited time left on this planet, I'm going to spend some more time dealing with. So that's another answer. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and there is another question that we got, and I'm glad you mentioned the, um, the like sculptural objects that now you have time to do that. Cause one of the other questions that we never got to get to was from Ashley Chukowski, I believe. And she asked, have you experimented with mixing the sculptural work and the ephemera with your photographs? And how do you think about that relationship between those two? Um, yeah, uh, good question as well. I'm definitely thinking about it now because up in the studio, you know, I have the pictures that I'm printing and the objects up at the same time. And uh, I, I've been thinking about that relationship, also the, the stereo pictures that I'm making that I was talking about earlier. Um, you know, three dimensions, of course, they relate more directly. But uh, yeah, I would, I think that I would like to move uh, my work a little bit more into installation and into physical objects. And so I'm thinking a lot about that relationship. And, you know, um, it's something that a lot of my students have worked on over the years, Ashley being one of them. <laughs> uh, and and um, they've raised interesting questions by doing their own work. And so I've stored a lot of it away in my head thinking, oh, that's interesting. You know, how might that affect what I do? And, you know, as, a, as an educator, I think it's really important to recognize that the two-way street involved in education that, you know, you you help to mentor your students, but then they also give back to you a lot of great things like ideas. So over the years, a lot of my students have um, done, I think, some really great work in terms of working with installation and objects. And so now that's starting to come back and I'm thinking about it, yeah. Amazing. Um, and I was hoping I can ask one more question that I wanted to ask you that we didn't get to. Um, okay. And so that is because I've read that a lot of people have talked about your work like that of like a historian. And I was wondering if you agree with that type of classification and if that, and if so, how that might affect the way that you're making work. I, I wouldn't um, want to claim that I'm a historian because I know real historians and I know how much they put into the scholarship and the research that they do. And um, I haven't done that, but I do find history to be really important. And I think there's a crossover and overlap between a lot of the things that I do and I'm interested in and what um, professional historians have been researching and, and written about over the years. And um, so uh, when I read what they've written or I run across them or I meet them and we talk, I find there's a lot of commonality. And I'm very interested in um, history of certain places and certain events and certain people. And I, I think that that has been um, very instrumental in my practice and how I focused on it. Um, last fall, I, I went to um, the conference of the Western History Association. It was in Las Vegas and I participated in a panel there that was on uh, re-photography and some very interesting re-photography projects that some of the some of the historians had had done, and um, I realized that you know the kinds of things that interest me also interest them. And so, you know, a lot of times people say, "What you know? What are you influenced by? You know, what are the things that that what are the?" I think any artist, the question might be, "What are the conversations you want to participate in?" And I think that a lot of those conversations for me are not in art necessarily, the art field, but in other fields. Um, and history is one of them, you know, history, um, environmental, um, the environmental fields, uh, geography, th those are areas that I feel I have a overlap with in the kind of interest that I have and the kind of work that I do. So yeah, I, I, um, I do have a very special interest in history and uh, I'm, hoping to continue to delve into that and that the work that I do, because I think it's inspiring. Uh, you know, it, it, history is, it's not that I'm interested in it for its own sake of the past, but I've felt for a long time that when I work with historical documents, 
that one of the things that I do is move that from the past into the present. And uh, I've often felt that whenever you do that, you're opening up a kind of Pandora's box about what people think about what history is. And so when I feel like I'm doing something that I'm, that I'm getting somewhere with either personally or like working with say Byron on Byron Wolf on a project, I think it's when we start to tweak history a little bit and we kind of question, kind of move it around. I think that ultimately, and I've said, I've said this before when he and I talked that one of the most subversive things you can do is alter people's thinking about what history is or a history of any place that that affects your thinking about what happened in the past that is happening in the present and what can happen in the future. That's why people don't like it when you mess with history. But I think it's a, I think it's one of those areas that um, is just ripe for, uh, it's an inviting people to, 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 or to fuss with. <laughs> and I'm glad to oblige sometimes. And in doing that rephotographic work, has it changed your perspective on that history at all? Yeah. Oh, sure. You know, um, because I think you, you have a sense of um, what that history is based on things you've read or you've been told or even the pictures. But in, when, when you go out to these places and you see where pictures were made and you start to explore the context for the view today, but also what could have been then, and you start to think about who made the view and why that person made it and why they didn't photograph that over there or that over there or something else and what they what they were thinking and you understand that the document is also an indicator of their particular view of the world and what influenced that and so forth that it starts to open up that whole door and you begin to question well maybe what i was thinking wasn't the case and how does it relate to what i'm experiencing now and just it, it, it does uh, some amazing things Great. So those are all the questions I had for you right now. Is there anything else that you wanted to say before we sign off? No, but I'm glad we could sort of get, we could sort of finish it, you know, finish it off a little bit and, and, uh, and that you got to the questions that you did because I think they were good questions. So I'm glad that uh, we were able to get there. So yeah. Thank thanks for, again thanks for, for being with us, Mark. Yeah. Thanks for asking me and take care. All right. Stay we'll fine. do. Appreciate right. it. Yeah.